cloud. Okay. Amazing. So um, I, just a quick reminder to everyone. Um, right now, I believe everyone is muted and that you cannot unmute yourself. What I'm going to do is um, remember to pause for questions at appropriate times, and then you can either write in the chat or raise your hand, or maybe you can request to unmute or get my attention, and I will allow you to unmute yourself if you have a question you want to ask. Uh, I also encourage you to make use of the chat function um, as, as necessary. So I'll try to keep an eye on it. So basically today we're going to be tackling a bunch of uh, chapters from Yirmiyahu, um, chapters 15 through 20. And uh, as I was preparing, I realized that most of the material can be broken up into three main themes. So the way we're gonna go about our learning today is we're going to tackle um, the themes, even though I'm, I'm basically gonna pull out the texts across the chapters and lump them by theme. Almost all of the texts um, are included, uh, but it's, they're gonna be a little bit out of order. So I strongly recommend that you follow along on the source sheet, which I'm going to share in the chat for those of us who do not have it. I'm also gonna share it on my screen, Jeremiah 15 to 21. Okay, so the main themes that we're gonna be talking about together today is we're gonna begin by talking about um, God's wrath and judgment. Uh, Sefer um, Yirmiyahu is a incredibly um, wrathful and angry uh, Sefer. God is extremely distraught and upset at Ben Israel's actions and um, articulates that through Yirmiyahu's prophecy um, in some very, very jarring, violent ways. Um, we have to remember, right, that Yirmiyahu lived before, during, and after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So his articulation of God's wrath found physical expression in the world in the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the people's exile to Babel. Um, and so, so that's an important thing to keep in mind as we read the prophecies about God's wrath and judgment. Then we're going to look at an extended metaphor about um, the potter and pottery that is used in these chapters, alluded to by the Nigun at the opening of class. And then we're going to end on, um, on the topic of uh, Yirmiyahu himself um, and who he was in his identity as a really tortured person, how the experience of living when he did with the job and mission that he had um, really tortured him um, and, and really hurt him and left him in these incredibly uh, conflicted, in this incredibly conflicted state. So we're going to take a look at texts which speak, which speak to that. So let's, let's jump in. Um, I'm going, let's start at, you know, the beginning of chapter 15 um, with a prophecy that really starts off um, expressing God's, uh, God's anger. So God begins this section by uh, by talking to Yirmiyahu and saying to him, um, Hashem Eli, right? God says to Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu is saying, God, God spoke to me. He says, Im ya'amod Moshe ain nafshi el ha'am hazeh. Even if Moshe was here, even if Shmuel was here, even if the people who could the best advocate, advocate the best for B'nai Yisrael um, in my eyes, even if they were here, I wouldn't listen to them. So Yirmiyahu, he's basically saying to Yirmiyahu, don't think that I'm going to change my mind. Don't try to argue for that for their sake. I am, my mind is made up. God doesn't want to see the people. He says, Shalach me'al panai v'yetzeu, send them away from me. And what is, um, that in itself, right, is, is a, quite a sentence, right? There's nothing you can do to change my mind, says God. Um, but what follows, I think, um, is even more gut-wrenching. When the people say to you, where am I supposed to go? Okay, God sent me away, but where am I supposed to go? What's the answer? You should say to them, Wherever you're going, it's nowhere good. Whoever's going to go to die is going to die. You're going to go you, wherever you run, wherever you escape to. If you leave God, right? If you're even if God's sending you away, if you leave from being before God, the end is destruction. So 
what this is basically communicating is that God says, I'm done with you. You can't change my mind. Go away from me. And any way in which you leave me will lead to your death and destruction. And that God is going to end up sending B'nai Israel to, um, to be killed by the sword, by dogs. Animals from the sky are going to eat them. They're basically going to be utterly destroyed. Um, and the reason right, the, that God gives Yirmiyahu for this is because of Biglau Minasha ben Yechizkiyahu Melech Yehuda al Asher Asab Yerushalayim, because of what Menashe did in Yerushalayim. So I was here, I taught that uh, Melachim lesson. Um, Menashe violated the, um, the Beit HaMikdash, put idols in the Beit HaMikdash. And this theme, the fact that Yirmiyahu is picking up on this theme of bringing idolatry into the Beit HaMikdash as the cause for this destruction makes a lot of sense. Because what Yirmiyahu is basically predicting is the destruction of that Beit HaMikdash and the exile of the people. And so to tie this punishment to the actions of what Menashe did, obviously, is slightly simplistic, right? It's not just that. There's a lot more things that are happening. There's a lot more wrong that B'nai Israel is doing. But what this is indicating is, is there's a mistreatment of the Beit HaMikdash, which Yirmiyahu talks about in other places, the mistreatment of, the, of sacrifices and the way people were comforting themselves in the temple. So this, um, this little beginning um, piece, these themes carry through, um, carry through in other places. So in Perak, um, in Perak Tet Zayin, um, God kind of continues. And um, when he, when God kind of decrees that B'nai Yisrael have done absolute wrong, the images that God uses, um, I think are quite fascinating. Um, this Perak opens with the statement that Yirmiyahu makes of chatat Yehuda ketuvam be'et barzel. The sin of Yehuda is written in a iron stylus, an iron pen. So now we have to pause here for one moment and remember the, um, the scribal traditions that are uh, prevalent at this time, right? There were things that were written on paper and on scroll, absolutely, uh, but this was much more a much more expensive method of writing. Um, that was much more expensive. Most of um, decrees to make something permanent or eternal, if you wanted to write something down, you took a tablet, usually a clay tablet or some kind of um, something that would write hearted and you, you'd carve into it um, writing. And um, doing this was really a sign of permanence. And this idea that you're taking a very tough material pen, right, like an iron pen, and you're carving into stone is supposed to give this visceral um, reaction of the seriousness and the permanence of the decree that God is um, that God is saying, right? That the, the sin, right? That this sin is so deep inside of them that it is inscribed with the stylus of iron. Um, but siporen shamir harusha, it's it's harush, it's it's engraved or it's like plowed right? in with a adamantine point. So this is some fancy word for essentially diamond. Right? We know that in order to cut, a, di a diamond is one of the strongest substances um, in the world. And so if you have a, a, a writing instrument made of diamonds, it's carved in this very intense way. And where is this carved? It's not written down on a tablet or on some, you know, kind of declaration, external declaration. No. Al luach libam, that the sins of Yehuda are carved into their hearts, right? And onto the, the, the altars, um, like the way that they worshiped, meaning what they've done has really impacted them. And then this next pasuk, I think for in a lot of ways is enigmatic, but what I think it means, right? The pasuk is, um, they remember, right? It's talking about their children remembering altars and sacred. What does that have to do with anything? I think it's a continuation of where B'nai Israel have carved their sins. That when their children think about worship, what is it that they're thinking about and they recollect? Their children are remembering the Avodah Zarah that they did. And so their sins of doing Avodah Zarah and not worshiping God are not only inscribed on their own hearts and on their own practices of worship, but they've actually impacted the way their own children think about and recollect what it means to worship, that they associate that with Avodah Zarah. 
And it is because of this that God says he's going to send, that God is going to send Ben Israel um, away because of their own actions. Um, he's going to send them away to a foreign land. And we see here God's fire. Ki eish kedach tem ve'api. I have a fire in me, says God. This fire is going to come back. But God, it's lit ad olam tukad. It is going to burn forever. And so we see this sense of finality here. Don't daven, right? Moshe couldn't change my mind, right? It's inscribed in your hearts with iron, right? And it's going to be burning against you. My, my anger is going to be burning against you forever. So there's this intense finality of what, um, what it is that God is, um, is saying. And so God continues and says, right? Yirmiyahu says, Hashem, arur hagever asher yivtach ba'adam. This is actually much more famous from the from a few psukim later where we get the contrast. So there's going to be a juxtaposition here. But this is a little bit more famous from the song, right? Baruch hagever asher yivtach ba'ashem ba'ya Hashem yivtacho yabarach hagever. Right from summer camp, we all know how to do the dance, right? So that's the positive, right? Praise be somebody who puts their faith in God. But first week, before we get to the praise, we see that Yirmiyahu is speaking against people who put their trust in man. Um, as you'll probably learn in other shurim, there's a lot of political turmoil happening here. And there's a lot of decision making that's happening amongst the elite and the rulers of Yisrael at this time about who should they have an alliance with? Who should they, right, politically, where should they be? Right? And in this prophecy, God is communicating through Yirmiyahu that you don't, don't trust people. Right, the only person, the only being, right, not person, the only being you can trust in is God, and so the curse that God gives to the um, these people is arur hagever asher yiftach adam. He says you're putting your faith in in people, and the English is he shall be like a bush in the desert that doesn't sense the coming of good. It's in a scorched place of barrenness. It can't be settled. You can be alone, a dry bush. This um, there's an alliteration here that's supposed to be haunting, right? Bahaya. Right, you are going to be like a, a, a like a bush in in dry land, and that is also a play on words of the sounds even in arur. Right, arur ke arar ba'arava. This is supposed to ring in people's ears. Right, being you're going to be cursed like a dry shrub. Right, who cares about a dry shrub? What what's the image? It becomes much clearer to us when we see the inverse. When we place our, our, our trust in God, um, God is going to be faithful. And what is the image used to describe this? That a person who trusts in God is like a tree planted by water. That if a tree is planted by water, even if there's a drought, it doesn't matter to the tree because um, its roots are right next to a constant source of, of water and it'll always be fresh and it will always grow fruit. So the contrast we have here is if the source of your power is a stream, it's reliable, it's always going to be there running right next to uh, right next to you like God, God's always constant, you can always rely on Hashem, you're never going to really feel the, the heat or the pain of being abandoned politically as opposed to if you put your trust in man, says God, um, you're going to end up um, dry, right? Without, without anything to rely on. Um, and then the, um, the, the Navi continues with um, talking about knowing God's heart. Who are you? How do you know if you're Boteach Bashem, or if you're Mitach Bashem or Mitach Adam? Hashem knows because Hashem sees into your heart. Choker Lev Bochin Klayot, a phrase that is borrowed for our Yom Kippur Tfilot as well. We say that Hashem is Bochin Klayot Balev. God knows our insides. God knows what it is that we trust. And we, at the end, um, say, we call God Mekor Mayim Chaim. That God is this source of eternal water that we always want to be, uh, we want to be placed next to, we want to be planted next to. So, um, hold on, I see there's a little, I'll get to the chat in one, one moment. Um, I just want to finish this section and then I'll take questions. Um, and we have this same, this same shock or the same metaphor, the shock is articulated in chapter 18, where we say, um, how could it be, right? Does Lebanon snow, right? Yazov mitzor, it's that's a hard verse to translate, but mitzor sadai sheleg levanon im yinachu mayim zarim karim nozlim. So it's, again, we have this this metaphor of my, uh, not alliteration, 
Mayim Karim, Mayim Zarim Karim Nozlim is supposed to be this like soothing sound, but it's a, it ultimately is a shock because we're basically saying like, how could it be, right? The, the hills, the mountains of, Le of uh, Lebanon always have snow on them. How could it have left, right? If you have this constant stream, like it won't dry up, but there's this shock that B'nai Israel has done this horrible thing by forgetting God and by leaving him. And instead of staying at this reliable source, they leave and then we have another kind of metaphor here of the road, right? That God has given them, um, given them, Sorry, um, right? They could have. Sorry, they 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 stumbled. They had they stumbled on this path of shvile olam, this pathway that was a forever pathway, this eternal pathway, this pathway that's been trodden by their ancestors, and yet they leave it. They go to an unpaved road, meaning they're going to this place that's far away, that's new, right? They're serving new gods that haven't been part of kind of their traditional worship and this is what's leading them away and therefore um, they're going to be scattered um, says God right the themes are the same but the image is changed and he says to them oref um oref velo panim er aim uh bayom adam a, um, adam that uh, that on the day of your dis disaster I'm going to see your oref I'm going to see your neck and not your face and there's a lot of illusions here um very often when we think about what it means to see and behold God, we don't see God's face, we see God's back. But I think this is really an allusion to Kishe Oref, right? That we're known to be a stubborn people, right? And then on the day of your exile, it's because you were stubborn and therefore lo panim er aim. I'm not gonna see your face. You're not gonna see my face. There isn't gonna be a closeness between God and, um, and B'nai Yisrael. Um, I'm going to pause briefly for questions. Sorry, I just know that um, isn't that a direct lift from Tehillim? I don't know exactly what verses you are um, you are referring to, but there's actually many places in um, Nevi'im Rechum Achronim in general and in Yirmiyahu where um, some of the language is very, very similar to Tehillim. Um, there's possibly sharing of source material. Um, oh, thank you. Yes. So um, it, there's a lot of sharing of, um, yeah, there's a lot of sharing of material. It's very possible that Yirmiyahu had, um, probably had Psalms, right? Tehillim is older. It's recording of a lot of traditions and he could have borrowed um, from, from that language in order to use it um, to make a point. Although we're going to see that that image Yirmiyahu um, is actually going to take and turn on its head in a little bit when we get to the last the last piece, this idea of being planted by um, by a stream of water. Um, any other questions before we move on? We're going to skip page three, which really contains my own personal musings about the New Testament. I'm happy to talk to people about that afterwards if you want to take a peek at the page. Um, but we're going to skip that for now. I'm getting applause for the New Testament. That's excellent. Thank you, whoever is applauding the, uh, the New Testament. <laughs> okay, are we good? Can we move forward? Oh, Jeff, yes, hold on. Go for it. Okay, I, asked um, I accidentally applauded, but uh, my other question is, what's the big deal with Shmuel? I understand why you invoke Moshe, but why invoke Shmuel? Great. So it's interesting. I don't think Shmuel really has gotten um, in our kind of like cultural sensibilities, gotten this level of um, acknowledgement. But there are actually a number of places in Tanakh where Shmuel is listed with Moshe. When we were talking about Tehillim, we say it every um, every Friday night. It's Moshe Aaron Bekoanavu Shmuel Bekorei Shemo, right? Shmuel actually in a number of places in the Tanakh is um, corresponded with, with Moshe. Um, I see it. I also think it's strange. I would need to look into it a lot more. I'm sure there's been writing about it. I just don't know the answer, but it's definitely some good noticing. Awesome. Okay. So let's move forward. We're going to talk about um, the extended uh, the extended metaphor here in Yirmiyahu in chapters 18 and 19 um, about the potter and pottery. And what we're going to try to tackle together is we seem to have two different um, sections of text that both use the image of um, pottery, 
but they seem to use it in very different ways. Yirmiyahu seems to use pottery in very different ways in these two, um, two texts. And I wanna to try to figure out together with you um, why. So in order to do that, let's first look at these texts individually. So there's a few places in, in, um, in the Navim in general, um, and in Yirmiyahu in particular, he's a little famous for this, where he does these physical, shocking physical signs. Um, I don't know if we got up to it yet, but there's a few years where he's supposed to walk around totally naked. Did we get up to that yet? Is that coming? We did that. That's passed. Yeah. Okay, good. Right. That's like shocking. There's also, um, it's upcoming, but he has to build this like shackles, like a yoke for himself where he like walks around with this contraption on his back for like years and years, right? Like he does these physical demonstrations, um, very tactile, very, um, de like he does, um, a lot of, a lot of signs and imagery and metaphors, but like physically. So one of those is captured in, um, in verse 18, in chapter 18. We are on page four. So in this, in this chapter, um, God basically tells Yirmiyahu to get up, kum, the aradata um, beit hayotzer, go to the potter's house, go to the place where somebody makes pottery. And, um, and there I'm going to give you a prophecy. So basically go and you know, listen to what I have to tell you when you get there. And so Yirmiyahu tells us, um, I go down. He's doing his work on the pottery stone, on the spinning wheel. He's making pottery. Um, and as he is, um, as he is, is working, um, if what he's making gets ruined, is something is wrong about it. Um, it gets, it gets ugly, whatever piece of pottery or clay he's working on. Um, what is he, Asher Hu that he's making with his material that he has. Um, this material is in the hands of the potter. potter. Um, he just kind of like undoes it. He like goes back, he makes it into something else. Whatever the potter wants the, the pottery to look like, that is what he makes it look like. And when Yermiyahu sees this, this is translated into a grand metaphor um, by God. By Yah, Zavar Hashem Elayli Mor, God says to me, Hakayotzer Hazeh Lo Uchal La Sot Lachem Beit Yisrael Nu Hashem. I can do to you, to Israel, says God, just like what this Potter is doing. This is where we get right. Hine Kachomer Beyad Hayotzer Kain Atem Biyadi. Beit Yisrael. This is how you are in my hands. And this line is the source for um, the refrain of the, the piyut that we say on, um, on Yom Kippur. And it's this declaration by God, which is essentially saying, I have total control over you the way that the potter has control over the vessel that it is making. And there are two radical implications of this statement. The first is, God says, Rega adaber al goy the alma mecha. At the moment that I say something about a nation, lintosh vilintots ula avid, I can pick it up and I can break it. I can change or break whatever it is that I decide to make. Veshav ha goy hahu meirato, but if they repent, asher dibarti a love, then the thing that I, I spoke about. I can go back on that ra that I said I was going, that I said I was going to do. I could change my mind. Just like if I'm making a, a thing and I don't like how it goes and I, I break it, I could make the same thing again if I wanted to. The inverse is true, says God as well. The rega atabar, and you see this is repeated, the same phrase, the same structure is repeated twice. Rega atabar al hagoy ve al mamlacha. He says again, rega atabar al hagoy ve al hamamlacha. Leave note, vilin toa. If I say I want to build something beautiful and it's going to be planted and lush and green and prosperous, the asahara be enai. But if it does, if they do the wrong thing, levilti shomea, um, shmoa bekoli, and they don't listen to my voice. Same, very similar phrase. I can also go back and I can change my mind about the good things that I said. And this is used to articulate in both ways God's total control over what it is that God said. That if God, God can change God's mind about whatever issue, whatever decree was issued. However, <laughs> um, it's concluded on a very sad note, this metaphor. 
because God says to Yirmiyahu, Ata and Morna, El Yishudav, El Yoshvei Yushalayim, Lemor, go tell them, Koamar Hashem. This is what God said. Hine Anochi Yotzer Alechem Ra'a. I'm forming bad, right? It's using the word Yotzer to give us this image of the potter, that God is in the middle of physically forming something that is, Choshev Alechem Machshava, I'm intent, I'm making a plan against you that is bad. So what do you need to do? You need to repent because the whole point of this metaphor is, yeah, I declared something bad, but if you do tshuva, you're wet clay in my hands. I could reshape anything that I've declared to do. That's such hope. But in the next line, we see that that hope is, um, is sensed, right? It's really is futile. The Amru, but I know what they're going to say. No Ash, right? It's no use. We're going to go after our own plans. God says, right? Uh, I made a plan against you, right? About you. But the Israel are going to say, no, I'm going to go after my own machshavotai, my own thoughts. Ish Shri wrote Libo Hara and everyone's going to do what they think is right for them. They're going to do the bad thing. And so for that reason, um, even though God is um, is warning them and saying, um, please change your ways. I, like a potter, can change what this, this vessel looks like. There's not really much hope that there actually is going, is going to be a change. This is Aleph, right? Part one of the metaphor. And as a metaphor, it really stands beautifully, um, beautifully on its own. Um, however, I think it really needs to be read with what comes a little bit later. There's a little um, interjection of a few of a few verses, but I think the story of the pottery picks up at the beginning of the next chapter of chapter 19. And in this chapter, God gives um, a command to Yirmiyahu about pottery as well. And God says to him, Go get a jug, a potter, a potter, pottery jug, bakbuk um, yotzer, right? A, a potter's jug, and um, and take a bunch of witnesses and go to sha'ar ha um, sha'ar ha 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 right? Go to the gate of broken pottery, right? Which is perhaps a place where there already was broken pottery, or maybe it got its name because of this action. It's not so clear. Um, but basically go and bring this potter's jug to this gate. And it doesn't become clear why he has the pottery with him until right, really the middle of the chapter. He brings this pottery with him and he goes and he starts to make this long speech, which we're not gonna go into detail, but about the horrors of horrors that are going to take place to B'nai Israel. The destruction that's gonna happen to their body. They're going to, the horrible things are gonna to happen to them because of the sins that they've done. And all we know, it's interesting, it tells us um, that everyone who hears about what happens to B'nai Israel, titsalna um, aznehem, their ears are going to ring, okay? and. What Yirmiyaku says is after saying all of these horrible things, he finishes his speech by doing something extremely dramatic and extremely drastic. What does he do? Take this jug and smash it and say, just like God says, God says, just like I'm going to smash this people, right? I smash this vessel. I'm going to smash the people. Or it's a very violent image. Um, and it can never be mended. Lo yuchal od. It cannot ever be fixed. This is, by the way, why I think he's telling them that people's ears are going to ring, right? By finishing this prophecy with smashing, I don't know if anybody's accidentally broken things, dropped earthenware vessels. I have um, definitely dropped my share of things in the kitchen that have shattered, right? It makes a very, very loud noise. And so he says, your ears are gonna ring from the sound of me smashing this pottery. And that is going to be the sensation that you're gonna have when you hear about the horrible things that are going to happen to B'nai Israel, um, B'nai Israel in this place. And this, um, this image is difficult because the whole point in this scene of using the pottery is that it can never be fixed, right? Um, 
this jug is broken. You can't put something, a broken earthenware vessel, you can never put it back together the same way it was before. And yet, in the preceding chapter, the whole image of the yotzer, of the potter, is actually an image of God being able to change God's mind based on the people's actions. And I think that this is such a fascinating juxtaposition because how is it exactly that we're supposed to understand these conflicting messages? That on the one hand, Yirmiyahu is saying, actually, guys, you could repent. But in another image in the next chapter, there's totally not a sense of being able to repent at all. And by the way, this is a whiplash that takes place all across Sefer, the, the Sefer, right? Where in lots of moments, God is saying, absolutely, I will not accept, right? Don't dive into me. I won't change my mind. And then there's other moments where Yirmiyahu seems to be trying to tell people to like reform their ways and be better. So how are we supposed to make sense of both of these, um, these metaphors together? So I have two possible suggestions. The first suggestion is, things are complicated. And sometimes there are just contradictions, right? Like this Sefer is written over many, many years. And it is totally possible that the message at some point is, guys, hello, let's go, be better, let's repent. And sometimes that, right, the message is, no, actually, he, there's nothing really that you can do, right? That it's a little bit, um, I think we look for something a little bit simple when we're trying to just see one clear cohesive message over a book that's like 60 chapters long written over, right, like 50 years, right? Like that's, it's complex. There's lots of different messages at once. That's one possibility. The other slightly more poetic possibility, if you'll let me um, try my hand at literary interpretation for a quick second, um, is I think that the state, that the moments of when we meet this, um, this pottery matters. Then in the first instance, when he's going to the potter, it's at a moment when um, the vessel is in formation. It's still wet, the clay is still wet. There's still opportunity for decisions to be made and for things to change, right? And so in that moment, when the material is still in formation, then repentance really can change uh, change matters and can really um, cause things to turn out differently. However, by the time we hit to we hit the second image, Yirmiyahu is going out with a completed vessel. Right? The vessel is dry. This clay is dry. Once you have dried earthenware, it's finished. Right? It's finished. It's done. And when that breaks and when that gets broken, that can no longer be repaired. So there's a sense of a, re of a reality here of the way we think about our actions and our behaviors. There is a time when we can do teshuva, we can repent, we can change the outcome of our ways. But at a certain point, there also need to be like real consequences for what we have formed. And at a certain point, right, that kind of decision has been made and maybe time for, um, for changing that decree passes. I'm going to take one more literary step. I think what I just said is on pretty solid grounds. I'm going to take one step, which I think might be a little extra, but you let me know what you think. Um, I'm re Yes, it's very, I see what you're saying, Jeff, about it feeling contrary to Yom Kippur davening. Um, part of what's difficult here is when we daven on Yom Kippur, we're very much talking about the God who's the potter who's forming the clay, right? We see ourselves as information. Um, and I think that's in a lot of ways, part of the trick is always seeing yourself in formation, right? When you see yours, and this is getting to my second point, right? when you see yourself as still wet, right? You're not fully formed. There's still opportunity for you as a person to grow, to change your ways and to be better, right? You're still moist clay, right? You still can be shaped and formed and forgive it. It's at the moment where we decide that we're done right, that we're stuck in our ways, that, um, that that's really when we quote unquote dry out and are no longer able um, to, be, to be forgiven and to be reshaped in, in, a, um, in a less kind of like permanent smashing kind of way. And my last step of this metaphor, I think, is when we see water in Yirmiyahu, what is water, right? Water is what keeps the clay moist. Um, and water, the metaphor across Yirmiyahu is water is God, is having a relationship with Hashem is that if we are in constant relationship with Hashem, we're all gonna constantly be in formation. We're not finished. There, even if we're squished, we're not smashed, right? The clay is still wet, 
because we are we are wet with Torah, we're wet with our relationship with God, and that enables us to constantly reshape ourselves. It's when we disconnect from that source of water, from our relationship with God, when we decide like, no, actually I'm finished, when we dry out metaphorically speaking, that's when our fate becomes sealed because we're not willing to make any changes and God is, right, we've left God, so God can't help us change. And in that situation, once we're smashed, right, the outcome can never, can never be repaired. That's me, I'm done waxing poetic, but that's, that's my interpretation of this, of this little section. I'm happy to pause we're, oh, we're doing perfectly on timing. I'm so excited. I'm happy to pause and take some questions if anybody has um, before we get on to our last section um, about Yirmiyahu as a tortured, tortured soul. We good? Okay, amazing. I wanna take a moment before we look at the text um, to just appreciate like what it meant to be a Navi, right? We don't always get such uh, intimate um, insights into like the live, live, lives of, of Navi'im, although many Navi'im we do. And we're gonna see some comparisons here between Yirmiyahu and other, other prophets. Um, but this was not an easy job, right? you were basically going and oftentimes speaking, right, the phrase that we use now is speaking truth to power, right? The Navi needed to go to the king, go to the many people who were alive, kind of in power and control in those days and tell them that they were doing something wrong, oftentimes. There were, of course, prophets, um, prophecies of comfort, um, which were positive, but oftentimes a Navi really needed to go and deliver some harsh, me harsh, harsh messages. Um, and it was not easy to be a Navi ever. And I think for Yirmiyahu, as we're going to see um, from what he writes about himself, um, he was particularly pained by this experience. And hopefully through looking at his words, we're gonna try to understand a little bit about the deep conflict of what it, of what it felt like to be, um, to be Yirmiyahu. So let's take a, a look here at um, chapter 15. Oh, I included the, the little, section from Yom Kippur Davening about the, the pottery here at the top of page six. Okay. The real striking, um, uh, to me, one of the things that's so striking about Yirmiyahu is, um, is the absolute anguish that comes through in his words. Um, the section begins, Ay li imi, Ay li, woe is to me, imi ki yelidatini, that my mother even gave birth to me, right? That um, expression, we're going to see he says it in another in another place, but this expression of like, oh my God, I wish that I had never even been born, right? Like that is a very intense expression of pain and suffering to reach a point um, of pain and suffering where somebody literally says, I literally, not only do I wish I was dead, but I wish I had never existed, right? Is a very, very intense um, intense expression. We're going to see it come up one other time. Um, but what it really reminds me of when I read that um, is him saying it was better that I shouldn't be born is the, the Midrash um, for, um, about Pesach, that we, we learn on Pesach about the enslavement in Egypt, how Amram separated from Yocheved, his wife. Um, this is the mother and father of, Mo, um, of Aaron, Miriam, and Moshe. After he had um, Aaron and Miriam, Amram separated from Yochavet because what did he say? He's like, this slavery is so absolutely torturous that I don't want to have more children, right? I cannot bring children into this world, right? And this theme is such is such an expression of anguish, right? and we're going to see it comes up in other places. But it's this it's this utter kind of like sense, not just of like things are bad for me, but I wish I never existed. How could I make anybody exist? Because nothing's going to get better. Right? It's, it's a real, real pain. And he, and he says this, he's like, oh my God, I wish I was never born. I am fighting with everyone, right? Keep in mind, what are the words he's saying? He's going about saying, everyone, you're all going to die. You're going to get destroyed. You're going to get killed and eaten by dogs. Your bodies are going to be food for the birds, right? He's like, fight. He, he, everyone's fighting against him. 
And he's like, everyone's fighting against me, even though I'm not a money lender. Right? I didn't do anything right that actually is make, pe making people argue with me. However, right, Kula Mikhalalani, everyone's cursing me. Um, and, and so he's, he's really upset about the way everyone's receiving him. But God responds to him. He has this back and forth with God and God responds to him. Um, and he, and he says, don't worry, right? It's going to be fine. Says God, right? You're, you're, you're going to be safe. I'm going to protect you. Can iron break iron, right? Like I'm going to, um, to hand you over, um, over your wealth and your, he's like, I'm going to give you everything. Um, give, sorry, I'm going to give all of B'nai Esau, um, away from you. I'm very, very angry, but God says, um, I, I'm going to ultimately protect you. Oh, sorry. That's the next piece. So God said, I'm going to um, send them away. And he says, Ki eish, so here's our fire again. Ki eish kadcha api alechem to kad. I have this everlasting fire, says God. I'm enraged against B'nai Israel. And this is when, um, when things, right? Yirmiyahu kind of turns to God and he says, um, God, I, um, I, I really want you to get revenge for me, right? You, um, I want, people are fighting against me. I want you to attack them. But then he says, this is where we get his trouble. Um, I love this pasuk. He says, when I found your words, I want to eat them, right? Like I, I devoured them. I like wanted your words, he says. Um, when I, when your words, God, when you speak to me, it like makes me so joyous and so happy. Right? Because your name, I'm known by you. When people see me, they say, oh, that's, there's your Miyahu. That's the prophet of Hashem. And so in this pasuk, he's articulating the absolute joy he feels at having the word of God come through him. And yet in the next pasuk, he says, um, Sorry, but because of your hand, right, because of your actions, God, I'm sitting alone because nobody, I'm, I'm full of gloom. Nobody wants to be around me. I'm totally, totally lonely. And he says to him, why? Why are my pains eternal? I'm eternally in pain and my wounds do not heal. And this is, this is where Yirmiyahu gets very, very angry at God. He says, um, God, you were like to me a faulty spring, right? I can't trust your water. This is after God assures, and Yirmiyahu gives messages where what does it mean to be with God? It means to be by a faithful stream. You're planted, you'll always be, um, have sustenance. And Yirmiyahu's like, hello, I, I was doing everything right. And I was right by you, but you failed me, right? This is totally a like Yirmiyahu saying to God, you have failed me and I am sitting here in absolute anguish. And so in each of, in this little section of Yirmiyahu's speech to God, you sense his internal conflict. That on the one hand, he's saying, oh my gosh, Hashem, I'm like so in love with your words. I'm so happy to be your Navi. But at the same time, in the next breath, he's saying, but I'm all alone and I'm in pain and I feel that you failed me, right? And he feels both of these things true at the very same time. After this accusation to God, um, God responds to him and he, and he says, um, don't worry, right? I'm going to protect you, not them, right? You're, you're going to be fine. The God says to Yirmiyahu. Um, and it's interesting, I think to me, right? The language that he says about kind of everyone else in B'nai Yisrael, he says, Yashuvu hema elecha. They're going to come back to you. The ata lo tashuv alehem. You are not going to return to them. Meaning they're going to be the ones to approach you and apologize. You're not going to be the one that approaches them. And what we're seeing here is a real standoff, right? Between God and B'nai Israel. And your Miyahu now is being placed on God's side, right? Where he's basically saying, I'm alone. I've been exiled from the people. I'm now here on the side of God. And God's basically saying, yeah, there is a conflict here. And they're going to have to turn to you, right? They're going to have to apologize first. And um, 
And it creates this enmity, really, between the Navi, which we're going to see in another text very soon. We're going to see this, this um, a transformation here where Yirmiyahu becomes angry at the people himself. He's upset and he wants Hashem to strike at, strike at them and punish them. Um, and God kind of validates that. Um, I think it's really important to remember, right, that traditionally Yirmiyahu is the author of Eicha. And one of the most famous lines of Eicha is Hashivenu Hashem Eilecha Benashuva, right? God, return us to you and we will come back. And it's so fascinating to see those, these two statements juxtaposed against each other, where Hashem basically tells Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu, you could have that chip on your shoulder. Be upset at them. They're going to come crawling back to you, not you back to them. And that, yet, that later we see right in Eicha how Yirmiyahu takes that and he, he literally flips that on its head and he said he places himself on the other side, right? He's writing with the voice of B'nai Yisrael and he says, no, Hashem, you bring us back to you first. You reach out to us first and then we'll come back. Um, which is again, another sign of transformation over time and really highlights in this moment, in this parak, um, the place where God and Yirmiyahu are in, in, in antagonism against against B'nai Yisrael, where God says, I'm going to make you a fortified wall of bronze against the people. They're going to attack you. No matter how hard they attack you, don't worry. Hashem, is, Hashem says he's going to, to save you from their hands and to protect you from the people. We're going to come back to a, a section which uh, mirrors some of these themes. But before we do that, I'm also very aware of the time, but I want to make sure we see this this section in chapter in chapter 16. Hashem gives a decree to um, to Yirmiyahu. I'm sorry, this is really where the, the connection to Pesach is a little bit more obvious. And God tells Yirmiyahu, um, Lo tikach um, lecha isha. Don't take a wife. Don't get married. Velo yihiyu lecha banim ubanot b'makom hazeh. And don't have any kids. Right? This is literally giving a command to Yirmiyahu to not have children. Why? Because this is what God says, that all of the family that you build is going to die really horrible, horrible deaths. Their corpses are going to be treated like dung. They're going to be devoured by the beasts of the fields. These are very, very yucky images. And so what basically God is telling Yirmiyahu, don't have children, I command, don't have children because any child you have, any family you build is going to be destroyed. And this next section here, um, verses five through nine, talks about an absolute cessation of life cycle events. Not only are we going, right, are you going to say don't mourn over anybody because it's actually probably better that they're, right, that they're dead, right? People are going to die. Don't mourn them. But also don't have um, don't have feasting, right? Don't be joyous. And don't, um, I'm going to send away from you um, the sound of joy, right? This is the opposite, right? Kol sason v'kol simcha, kol chatan v'kol kala, but not in the happy way. God says that's going to stop. That's going to be taken away from B'nai Israel. And so this section really highlights the stopping of the normal life cycle, that life as you know it is going to be utterly destroyed. And for that reason, God tells Yirmiyahu basically don't have children. And so there's a metaphor here, right? But we also have to remember that the metaphor is actually Yirmiyahu's real life, right? Like it's not just cute, not right? Cute is not really the right word, right? But it's not just like, oh, don't have kids that everybody knows, right? It's not like an image, right? This is his actual real life, right? Yirmiyahu doesn't marry and doesn't take children, right? Theoretically, at least according to this prophecy. And the reason why this is important is because when he describes how alone he is, right, he says, I'm sitting here um, alone, right? He's literally alone. It's one, it's just him against everyone. He doesn't even have a family. God doesn't even let him have a family, right? And that demand that God makes of the Navi, right, is, is, a, is not just like a metaphorical demand. It has like lasting long-term implications for like who he is and his psyche as a human being which we're going to see, um, he's not so happy, right? He's not so happy. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going so we can finish our text. And I'm going to stay a little bit late so we could, um, so that I'll be able to answer questions. So if you have questions, hold on to them or comment. I would love to hear them. But for now, I want to just push forward so we can, we can finish. 
Um, but right in chapter 17, this is, by the way, also, again, I'm fascinated by this is where we get our tefillah. Um, right, this is the source of our tefillah in the, in the Amidah, where he basically says, Hashem, please, please save me. Okay. Why does Yirmiyahu need saving? Because not only are people fighting with him, not only does he not have a family or anybody on his side, he finds out that um, where people are really bothering him and they, he's, we're gonna see that they really uh, plot against him. He says, everybody's saying to me, where is, you're bringing all these prophecies, oh God, God's gonna destroy us. And they're all hanging out and they're like, actually, where is God's prophecies, right? Like they're mocking him. They're saying like, what you're saying is not true. And your Miyaku is, um, is so hurt by this because he basically, he says, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be a shepherd for your people, right? The Yom Anush Lo Hit Aviti. I didn't want this job. I didn't want to prophesy that, that the people were going to be we're going to be destroyed. I'm only doing it, right? Yerbiahu says to God, data I'm only speaking because you told me um, what to say. And this frustration on the part of Yermiahu is actually really analogous to another Navi. Um, we're gonna see nav the Navi of um, Amos, where Amos basically is like, I didn't want this job. Right? Nobody wants to be this person who's going to like prophesy all these horrible destructions that are coming about onto, onto the people, right? He's say, basically saying like, I, I don't want to do this. Don't make fun of me, right? I'm just doing what God told me to. Um, and therefore he says, and this is really where we see a turn in his thinking. He's like, I didn't do this for myself. I'm just doing my job. And therefore, um, but Yirmiyahu who says, all I have is you, God. And so therefore, um, anybody who's who's making fun of me, I want you to shame them, right? Um, and don't let me be ashamed. Let them be dis like, let them be bothered and not me. And you should bring on them a day of disaster and shatter them more like double than what, what I said, right? Because they're basically saying like, oh, where's the word of God? It's not coming true. And he's like, Hashem, make it come true to protect me. Right? And because we've set up this adversarial relationship, the only way that Yerbiahu can become justified is through the destruction of his own people. And he's really, really stuck. The next section in 18, we see that there actually are um, plots. People are literally plotting to kill Yerbiahu, which makes sense, right? He's prophesying the destruction of the temple in the Beit HaMikdash. We skipped that line above, right? But he's, he's causing a lot of problems. And people actually literally are... Um, are um, fighting, um, are, are sorry, are trying to hurt him. And we see in this next section, we're not gonna go into detail, but he basically davens to Hashem that Hashem hurt the people who are planning against him, right? Other people in B'nai Israel who are planning to um, to kill him. And this is, uh, this is illustrated in chapter 20 by um, Pashur, who is, seems to be some kind of um, important person in the Beit HaMikdash, um, he was kind of some head of the Kohanim, and he actually puts Yirmiyahu in jail for a while. Um, and and Yirmiyahu, after he lets Yirmiyahu out of jail, Yirmiyahu renames him. And he says, um, you're not going to be called um, Pashur anymore. What's your new name? Is Magur Misaviv. We're like, what the heck does that mean, Magur Misaviv? Kiko Amar Hashem. Hashem says to him, Hinini no tencha limagor. I'm going to make terror for you. So he's going to receive terror. And then it doesn't, it's, the Pasuk doesn't explicitly say, but he's named Magur Misaviv. There's terror all around, right? You're going to be totally consumed by terror. And it goes into horrible detail about when he gets sent into exile because of what you've done to me, your Miyahu prophesies that you and your whole family are going to be utterly, utterly destroyed. And the reason why this shows up here is first of all to show us that there really were specific people who were like capturing, targeting, oppressing, bothering your Miyahu. Um, but also there's a literary connection to a piece that's stuck on at the end of this parak, um, which is quite powerful. Um, there's not a there's not a um, 
narrative connection here, but what you'll see is here, Yirmiyahu talks about Kishamati Dibat Rabim Magor Mi'isaviv. Yirmiyahu says, I heard people talking about me, Magor Mi'isaviv. There were like whispers all around me of people whispering, oh, we we're going to inform on him. So he describes it as Magor Mi'isaviv. And that's why this, um, this little section was placed next to the unrelated, thematically unrelated Magor Mi'isaviv renaming of Pashur. But it's this piece of text, which I want to focus on you, focus on with you for the, for the next few minutes. Birmiahu says, Pitisani Hashem va'efas, chazaktani vatuchal. Sorry, Haiti should be on the next line. Yirmiyahu says to God, this word, by the way, you'll see if you look at the, the Heschel um, little summary over here, he, he articulates it. This word seems to be used, is, is a shoresh that's used um, for, for rape. Um, that you kind of, God, have seduced or you've taken me and you've overpowered me, says Yirmiyahu. I am a body, right? And you, God, are more powerful than me and you are essentially violently forcing me to do things that are against my will to a native speaker, right? To the people, right? To reading this, right? This, this um, image is supposed to be really jarring and really violent of this like absolute loss of control on your Miyahu's part of, of God, you've, you've totally overpowered me and everyone is making fun of me because every time I talk, I have to cry out Hamas, right? I, I have to scream at people that they're doing, that they're doing the wrong thing. And your Miyahu says, Okay, so what sorry, what would you say to Yirmiyahu? Okay, so like just just don't do it, right? I'm totally disgraced because I'm walking around yelling at people. But what does he say? He says, the Amarti, and I said to myself, Lo es kirenu, the lo adaber od bishmo. Okay, I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm gonna get these prophecies and I'm just gonna keep them to myself. I won't actually go deliver these prophecies. But what happens? My heart, it felt like in my heart, like I was burning. There was a fire burning inside of me. It was shut up in my bones. And I couldn't hold, I couldn't hold it in. I was helpless. I needed to go deliver these prophecies. And so therefore I was basically forced to be, to be a Navi even against, he's saying this whole section here is like, it's against my will. I didn't want to do this, says Yirmiyahu. And this is really taken poignantly um, because even though he kind of says, you know, I, I had to do this, he believes that God is going to protect him, right? So we have this like vacillation here again. He says, I'm going, going to, um, they're going, ultimately I'm going to be fine and God will protect me because he believes that God knows um, that God knows who is righteous and who is justified. And yet, even after that moment of articulating this faith and belief in God, it's then immediately followed by Arur Hayom Asher Yuladati Bo. Cursed is the day that I was born. Yom Asher Yuladatani Imi, the day that my mother gave birth to me. Al Yihi Baruch, don't bless that day and curse to the person who came and told my father, congratulations, you have a baby boy. Because, and then, and he was so happy. That was not a happy day, he says, that was a horrible day. I would rather, he says, that that person who reported to my father that I was born should have killed me before my death and that my mother would walk around a pregnant woman with a dead fetus inside of her. It's like a very horrible, horrible image and it's supposed to be gut-wrenching and horrible. He's like, I'd rather be dead in my mother's womb because then I wouldn't have had to come out um, because lama ze me rechem yatsati. Why did I even leave my mother's womb? Lir ot amal biagon vayachilu bevoshet yamai. That I should come out and I should see these horrible, tragic things around me. And it's in these speeches from Yirmiyahu that we see that he's holding inside of him so many painful and contradictory emotions. That even as he recognizes God's justice and believes in God's protection, it's turning him to both intentionally ask God to take, aven take vengeance on Yirmiyahu's enemies, which are his fellow people, and also to articulate the word of God, which he can't hold in, which is basically telling everyone around them that they're gonna die 
and he can't hold it and he has to walk around. He has no friends, he has no family and he doesn't wanna be giving this message. Yet at the same time, he also recognizes that he's absolutely in love with God and he wants to be called by God's name and he has a special relationship in God that he trusts in. And so this kind of like totally torn, ambivalent, um, tragic character is really the character of Yirmiyahu, who is, go who is, you know, we've been learning and continue to learn and is the person who writes Eicha and sees the destruction of, of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, and it's really like, there's nothing, <laughs> I'm like, I always want to end on a happy note, but part of the point here is, is that we're really supposed to feel his suffering and his anguish. And Heschel, if you read this Heschel um, piece and really the rest of Heschel's analysis of the prophets is his claim is kind of that the prophet becomes a human mirror of God. That really this feeling of being absolutely torn up and tortured by the one you love who you still have to speak against that you feel animosity towards is really a metaphor for the way that God feels about B'nai Israel right now. Right, that like Lahavdil Elif Havdalo, God too is absolutely torn apart by what God is doing and saying and causing to happen to B'nai Israel, and that God, God's self, feels without spouse and without child. Right, B'nai Israel is God's spouse and God's children. Right, in metaphorically, and so by seeing the pain that Yirmiyahu is in and how torn apart he is, I think in some ways is supposed to, first of all, help us understand the place where his prophecies come from and the violence and anger and really sense that from the prophecies, but also to help us understand a little bit better the ethos of God, the way God thinks about and relates to uh, the horrible destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the exile of the Jewish people, that it wasn't such a Pasha thing on God's part either, that yeah, God is angry, but God also at the same time, totally contradictory, loves us and is heartbroken by, and totally torn apart um, by what's happening. Um, I will stop there. Um, there's an interesting part of text about um, Shabbat observance that's on the last page if you want to um, to read that and take a look at that. I also strongly recommend reading the little Heschel piece that I put in there at the end. Um, and Heschel's whole interpretation on the prophets is, is absolutely, um, absolutely beautiful. Um, but I'm happy to stay a little bit and answer some questions and um, Shavuot Tov everyone. Thanks for coming out to learn on Sunday night and I'll be back in two weeks. Let me allow you to unmute yourself if you would like. There we go. So I have a question, Aura. Um, yeah. It seems to me 